a weird thing. All right, so tests will be on Tuesday. Um, and yeah, there's not much of a study guide. We wouldn't do the last time, which you guys need to do. Uh, you guys are welcome to work through this. Your homework will magically, I'm not really sure how, be graded tomorrow by 4 o'clock. So, and so you come pick your homework up at 4. And if you want, you can come pick up by 5. So, between 4 and 5, we'll write up the solution that the kids play. We'll also be posted on uh, Blackboard. So, you can either just pull it down or anytime tomorrow, uh, you can come and grab a copy. I might even just put a folder on my front door uh, because of how we talk playing volleyball. Is it where you focus on the kid mine at work? Does it focus a lot on homework? Um, yeah, I'd say so. I mean, I don't want to get too far from homework. I want to make sure that it's everything that's on the I told you the things that I'm going to be looking for. So. It's really not going to be anything scary. It's just going to be a rehash of the things you know. And I just want to know that you guys understand the basic concepts. Upper level physics isn't supposed to be the torture thing. The intro level ones are. Topics themselves are torture enough. At least you admit it was torture. What? At least you admit it was torture. It was torture. No, it's not. not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It was what? It's not the overload of stuff. Well, it's actually, um, and it's taught in more time than traditionally uh, courses are. Uh, we had twice the amount of time because it was in the brain the labs. Normally, you only have all of that material in uh, three hours a week, three one hour class periods. So it gets exciting. In fact, that's my biggest dilemma is we're, we're not building a dedicated physics lab right now. Um, didn't need the money to do it, so we're turning a four four six gym's room into a, uh, a dedicated physics lab, so I have a little laboratory, which would be awesome. That means the classes and labs are going to start to be separated. So it would be like, take like three hours of lab and three hours of lab. No. That would be awesome. Well, well it only, I mean, we did that whenever we did a two hour lab. I, what I really would like to do is move it to a four hour lecture two-hour lab, and that's more reasonable. Just like the same schedule that you have set up almost for... Kind of, because, yeah, but I mean, it seems that you're doing more one lab a week, and you're doing four lecture hours, but um, that's not jiving with what the rest of the state does. So so they, they, do, they do three, well, because we have to be accredited. Oh. I mean, not accredited, but you have to have transfer yeah. credits. So, so and that's my one worry. It's great to have a lab, but it's going to be really hard for the students to lose a lot of lab. lecture within lab. Which yeah. is going to end up having to happen. So the first hour of lecture is going to have to be, or first hour of lab and lecture, most likely. And Fiona said you're even more so. <laughs> Say again? Okay, I just uh, and Fiona said Fiona said you're even more so. And you actually see how you can squeeze all that into four hours. Scary word. No. Quantum. No. Yeah. Yay. See, scary word for you, but for the peak hammers, the, the class is going to be longer. That might be. Is it? Yes, this should be. All right, so we're, we're moving into the second half of this class. First half is all relativity, special in general. Now we're into yeah. the tiny things. We're into the quantum world. Okay. Now, this is, um, has some inherent difficulties associated with it. And the first one we're going to talk about. If I go to the PK, what can help with this? Uh, maybe. Do you remember it? That's no problem. Hey, a little handy phrase. To observe is to disturb. Um, this is kind of a problem. The very act of looking at something perturbs the situation. And this is what makes quantum so difficult. What do I mean by this? All right, let's say that you want to analyze a ball falling through the air. Okay, what do you do with that? Well, you can use one of those motion detectors that's basically bouncing sound waves off of it. And you can figure out how fast it's falling. Aha! You cheated. You bounced sound waves off of it, so you slowed it down. I don't think the basketball cares about the sound wave you bounced off of it. Okay? Um, and that's actually a pretty large uh, perturbation. All right, new plan. Let's just say that I'm really awesome with my vision. Instead, I've just, or I got a camera. I've got a camera that's taking 30 frames a second. I watch a basketball fall. And I watch where it was at all the different frames. And when it gets down to the bottom, I can calculate the velocity. Ha! Now I haven't perturbed the situation. Right? Yeah. Wrong. Um, just by looking at it, the only way that you can look at an object, you have to bounce light off of it. Okay? Now you can say, well, light's bouncing off of everything already. Okay, yes, at this level. Now let's go look at something small. Let's say we want to go look at something as small as an electron. If you all of a sudden want to start looking at an electron, you need to bounce light off of it to do that. So 
Should I put the electrons to there and be bouncing like, oh, damn it, I launched my electron just by polishing some photons off of it so I could see the damn thing. Here is the problem. So even just to see things, you have to bounce photons off of it so you can get light, which means that you might have knocked it away from wherever you're looking. And even if you didn't knock it away, you've definitely changed the amount of energy that it has. So at the small level, to observe is to disturb. That becomes a real issue. OK, so first topic we're going to talk about here is black body radiation. Okay, the year is 1999, or 1990. <laughs> See, for me, I'm a fair bit older than you guys. The whole uh, Will Smith party like it's 1999 was a long time of listening to that song before it actually became 99, or 99. You guys were what? Six? No, you were? Seven. Yeah, I was five. Three. Three? Seven. What year were you born? 93. Wait, oh, sorry, I'm looking at that number. <laughs> I'm looking at 1990. Okay. You're off to a good start. But that is not a good day for me. <laughs> uh, okay, I think we even had bigger problems. So in 1990, you were three? Yeah. Mm, okay. <laughs> Maybe. We've got bigger problems. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. All right, the year is 1990. Man, it's Max. Okay, Max Planck. Um, cool guy, German. Okay. Who is he? Alright, he studied under, underneath this guy known as Kirchhoff. His master was Kirchhoff, and this was at the University of Berlin. In fact, he took over for him in uh, the year 1887. Any ideas why he took over for him at the University of Berlin? Just random logical guesses? Died. Kirchhoff died. And that's kind of the way that things used to work before. You know, you'd have a physicist and then you, you take on a student and they were a student of yours till you died and then you became the teacher. So, I mean, very kind of old school you know, Japanese way of thinking. Okay, so Kirchhoff did a lot of really cool things. What? Planck did it and knocked it on it. Yes, oh, we're, sorry, I backtracked a little bit. Oh, okay. So we're going to be talking about this. I'm just talking about where Max Planck came from. Okay. So he studied at the University of Berlin and uh, as a physicist there, and then when Kirchhoff died in 1887, he then became head of the. Yeah. Why don't you take 10 seconds to catch him back up? Quantum or temperature? That's what I figured. That's all three and quantum on four. Yeah. So we're talking about quantum and how it's difficult to observe some of the stuff. Um, first, we're talking about the motivation for quantum, where this stuff came from, why it was a problem in the first place. Okay, so Kirchhoff, really cool. I actually really like Kirchhoff. Max Planck is really not terribly interesting, even though he's got the, you know, we went when I was in high school, we went to Max Planck Institute, and they named a lot of stuff after him, and he won the Nobel Prize, which we'll talk about in a minute. In the scheme of things, a physicist of this time I don't think he's that impressive, but you know, who am I to talk about? Oh. I know, I haven't done anything. But he's going to constantly name after him. But he does have a constant name after him, and we're about to talk about that. Okay. And why he's not necessarily totally impressive. Okay, so, now back to this 1990. At the time, the one thing that was known, that all moving objects Electromagnetic radiation. All moving objects emit electromagnetic radiation. Okay, so let's think about this for a minute. What is electromagnetic radiation? Um, fundamentally, all that means is that all moving objects emit photons. Okay, there's three different types of ways that you can have heat transfer. What are they? Remember this back from 2211 or 2201? What are the three ways that we can have heat transfer? You don't even know what the terms. Just can you describe it? Is it more mechanical? Um, Maybe. Um, like 
No, I mean, uh, that, that's not a bad way to explain it, but they wouldn't call it critical. Is one result of friction? Uh, yeah. So you guys are both on the same one. So a mechanical or frictional one, specifically contact. Let's literally think about how you can transfer heat. Okay? What do you tell the little kid? Don't touch the stove. Why? Don't touch the stove. It burns you. It transfers heat faster. Only if it's all. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can heat it. You can heat it. You can heat it up something else. Only if it's hot. It's important that we know. It doesn't matter if it's not hot. You can heat it up something else. It's getting hot. Alright. So, uh, anybody know that type of heat transfer? Contact? Uh, you guys used to have to do this. There's only two of them that we went over. It's called conduction. The process of conduction. Right? And they own induction, right? They own what? They own induction. No, induction is the way you charge your phone, the Nokia phone. It's a very different process. Induction is electric, uh, electromagnetic. Uh, Alright, the other two. Convection. Okay, which one was convection? Uh, it's either three C's, right? No. Stop. Reasonably certain, like let's go with a 70% certainty, you know, confidence interval for your things that come out of your phone. So <laughs> that's how you choose whether or not to comment. I should just but show I was. the flavor thing. I was three years old in 1990. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, convection. Convection has to do with fluids. Fluids heat transfer. In other words, air, water. Remember in physics, we don't determine, we don't distinguish between gases and liquids. They're both fluids. So convection is how you do that. So in other words, if the wind blows, it feels colder outside, okay? Because you're losing heat transfer to convection. All right, the third one. Come on, guys. Is that why I call convection? Um, it's one's a fan energy. Yep. Because it's moving and it keeps it. Okay, so uh, the first one's conduction. Now, the, the weird thing about it is they're both convection, so it's really kind of stupid. Yeah. But it's a, a better convection oven, yeah. but that doesn't make a lot of sense if you call it a better convection oven. So what do you have conduction, convection. There we go. Why do we have why do we have life? Why are we actually living here? Because the sun is warming us up. I'm pretty sure the sun isn't have a big fan and blowing a nice warm breeze at us. It can't blow anything. There's nothing in between here in the sun. So radiation is the third one. Okay. So now getting back to this idea, all moving objects emit electromagnetic radiation. All moving objects have energy. They have a certain amount of energy. At the atomic level, what that means is they're vibrating. Okay? So if you heat something up, let's say you take a, you know, you take a cow, uh, cow iron? What am I thinking? Cow prod. Cow prod. No. Cow prod. No, cattle prod. Oh. Cattle prod. Oh. There we go. We'll get there. Cattle prod. You put it in the fire, heat it all, it comes back out, it's glowing. At the atomic level, what's happened is you've added a bunch of heat to the bottom, and they're vibrating like crazy. They're emitting electromagnetic uh, magnetic radiation, photons, in the visual spectrum, and that's why we see it lit, lit up. So it turns out that even things that we, this has a certain amount of heat, this is also emitting photons, it just doesn't have to be in the visual spectrum. Okay. Now, the way that you know that it's necessarily emitting it, think about something that's hot, and I don't care what it is, heat up anything and say, keep your heat, don't share. In other words, can you get close to anything hot and not have it be hot? Is there any way for an object to hold all of its heat in? And it's impossible. Okay, and that's why we have thermoses and things like that that try to do their best to limit it. Um, in fact, a thermos, the whole goal of thermos is to remove convection and conduction and only leave radiation left over, which is one of the most difficult ways to heat. You know, it's a really damn good thing there's nothing in between here and the sun, because if it was filled with goo, like air and things like that, we'd be dead instantly. Because it can transfer heat much faster through air than it can through radiation, which is the only thing that's left. So we would be instantly fried. That'd be bad. Um, Okay, but we like radiation. Radiation is a good way. So, back to this. All moving objects emit electromagnetic radiation, which is to say that all moving objects emit heat. They emit photons. Those are one and the same. I just want us to get on board with that. All right. Now, not only do all moving objects emit electromagnetic radiation, but all objects, period, whether they're moving or not, uh, absorb and reflect uh, EM radiation. Alright, 
right, give me something that's a good reflector of electromagnetic radiation. Sure, why not? Even something similar. What is the thing that we see, that we look into every day that is the best electromagnetic radiation device? No, no. Air? Potatoes. <laughs> no, a mirror. Just a mirror. You shine light at a mirror and it bounces off. It's the whole point. You see what potatoes is a really good answer. I just throw that in there. Like the perfect level of comic relief. Potatoes. Um, no, a mirror. If you shine light at it, you shine a laser at it, it reflects almost all of that light. Photons being the electromagnetic radiation that bounces off it. Okay, so you'd say in the mirror, say, oh, my electromagnetic radiation looks good today. So you made a such that you want to look at a mirror. Say what? Something down there. <laughs> anyway, um, all right, give me an example of something that doesn't, that is not a good um, reflector of electromagnetic radiation. But a rock. A window. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, uh, a window is 50-50, because a window, you can get kind of the mirror effect off of it. So you're going to get about half the thing bouncing off and half the light passing through. Um, so so what's that spot is good? Black clothing. Lead. Can you look at your reflection in your black t-shirt? No, Can you're going to have a hard time doing that. So if you have a black room at all, like if you're in a solid black room and you shine, shine a light, you don't see that light reflect off the walls. It hits one wall and says, I'm going to stay here. Black specifically absorbs all wavelengths of light. That's kind of the whole reason for it. Now, this is kind of a random thing, but um, in Saudi Arabia, you might notice that a lot of times, instead of wearing white robes, a lot of times men wear black robes. Did I explain this to you guys why before? Now, this is kind of an interesting. They will specifically wear black, even though they know for a fact that it absorbs more uh, heat. The reason being is it absorbs more heat up top, and heat rises. Okay, so what's going to happen is it's going to heat up the air underneath there, and that air is going to rise up off the top, so it'll keep it loose and it'll come up. It creates an actual wind path. So wind will pull up underneath, and they've actually got constant convection that's going, so they've got this air current. It's just like when you get into the car. There's, you know, you have the two different choices. Some people say, no, I'd rather just sit in the hot car. My best friend's like this. Um, he's like, I, I don't turn on the air until I know it's cold. Now for me, I don't care if the air is blowing hot. I just want blowing Air. Air is, I like the moving air. So I guess there's two different camps on this. The reason they wear the, the black is because they actually need currents of air moving. Because air heats up faster. Okay. Uh, back to this. So, things that absorb, we'll go with black. And things that reflect, things that appears, or anything that you can see an image in, aluminum foils, and stuff like that. If you can see your image in it, it, that's exactly what is going on that is reflecting this electromagnetic radiation. Okay, so the goal back then was to create something that was a perfect black body radiator. What does that mean? Something that would perfectly absorb all the light. So they constructed a device that I'm off the charts here. Okay, they constructed something that's going to look like this. Now, this is a two-dimensional version of, think of it, just bowling ball. Okay, bowling ball that's got a cavity on the inside. So, so when, once that, then they took a drill, and they drilled at some random angle sideways into the bowling ball. Now, it's important that that angle is sideways and is not just straight up. That it's not uh, perpendicular to the surface. Why? Because here's the goal. What ends up happening is, do I have any other colors in here? No, I don't know. All right, so they shine some light into this thing. In comes the light, bounces off the wall, 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 and it goes around here all day long. In theory, the light, and, and the whole point of this is that this is all painted with a thick black paint on the inside surface. So, when I say it bounces off, in theory it shouldn't bounce off much. Okay? You can get a slight reflection off a black shirt and stuff like this, but the reflection is very small. So it bounces around a couple times, and we're assuming that the light is not going to escape. All right, new plan. Now what we're going to do is we're going to leave this laser light on for a long time. Okay, long, long time. 
What's going to happen is this is going to come in here and it's going to heat up the inside surface of these. So the inside surface is all at a constant temperature. Okay? So all the light's been absorbed at a certain wavelength and now it's, it's all heated up to a constant temperature and then bam! Turn, turn off the light source. Now, does any light escape out? In theory, not much should. But if any light does escape out, it's going to be based on this temperature T that's the same as the temperature T of the inside walls on here. Now the thing is, when you put light into a, a subject, even if it's absorbing it, if like, your black shirt is absorbing light, the problem is that that means that the black shirt is now vibrating. Okay, so now it is going to emit a little bit of light out. So now black being more absorption, it can handle a lot of energy before it starts vibrating out too much. But when it does vibrate out, it should all vibrate out at the same temperature T that's on the inside. Okay, so they did this. And then they experimentally measured the energy as a function of frequency. So the energy is a function of frequency, and they found that they got some sort of weird curve like this. So they're looking, so at certain frequencies, they had, at higher frequencies, they'd have low amount of energy in the light, and there would be some peak value, okay, right here. So that was what the, and this would, they would call the characteristic temperature of the light based on the heat of this. All right, no big deal. Experimentally, this wasn't a, that big of a deal, but there was a problem as far as the classical theory. Classical theory says, where's my eraser? Wait, am I still over here? Classical theory said that electromagnetic radiation is just a wave. At this point, we were assuming that light was a wave. And that's how it traveled. Went along as a wave. That's a slight problem. The reason that's a slight problem was because the idea being is if light is just a wave, as you got to higher and higher frequencies, like this, the amount of energy to compact light into a tighter frequency became infinite. Okay? It gets really hard to get super high frequency light. There's a lot of energy associated with that. So when they would put back over here to the curve, and this was known as Wien's Law, Wien's Law said that yes, for low frequencies, this makes sense, this makes sense, this makes sense. Wait a minute, where the hell are you going? Okay, it predicted that the energy as a function of frequency should go off to infinity. For low frequencies, it's not a problem. For high frequencies, um, this became a real issue. Okay, not only that, and it wasn't like that they necessarily even believed classical theory. They knew it was wrong. They had to be somewhere wrong. Because this was predicting that materials were radiating infinite power. Okay, if you just heat up the black body, they're saying infinite power should come back out. Because once you start integrating over these high frequencies, this tail should go out for forever. Okay, so that's kind of a problem. All right, so Planck solved this problem. Planck said, he pressed solve on his TI-89 calculator and came out with this. Um, energy is a function of frequency equals NHF. You might not have had TI-89. I wanted to call it. So he said the, the only, and what was he trying to do with this? He was saying that, okay, the only way that we can make classical theory match this curve, or in fact, the only way that we can match this curve at all is if we say the energy as a function of frequency equals this screwy thing. Well, what is this screwy thing? It says that n, n is an integer, h is a constant, and f is the frequency. So he comes up with this, and then he put it onto the, the plot over there, and it was his perfect match with the experimental data. Okay? But this was, honestly, all he was trying to do was sit there and, and he was like basically taking a polynomial. What do I need to multiply this to so that it matches the graph? And he just did this to this, and he found this, which in and of itself is kind of fascinating that you could even match the graph in the first place with a function that was so simple. Now, in doing so, he came up with the idea that this constant here, this h, which later became known as Planck's constant, was 6.6 times 10 to the minus 34 meters per second. Okay, 
So he said, well, if we do this stupid little mathematical trick, all of a sudden everything works out. And everybody went nuts, except him. He looks and goes, well, no, I mean, this doesn't solve anything necessarily. This is just a mathematical trick that makes this work. And Einstein and everyone else um, came to the conclusion, no, this is actually something that's real. What this is telling us is that energy is quantized. That energy cannot exist at all energy levels. When you get down to the tiniest energy levels, which are required at the highest frequencies, there are only certain energy levels that objects can actually exist. And there's discrete jumps in between them. That's what this is saying. That's why I said energy value. In other words, say I want an integer of 2.7. Well, for a given frequency, you have to multiply by your Planck's constant, you might not be able to have that energy. There are only certain energies that a good frequency of light will put out, period. Now, this did explain the fact that when they integrated this, and before Wien's law, that they were getting the infinite power put out. They're getting infinite power because they're integrating over an infinite number of energy possibilities. The idea that if energy is quantized, all of a sudden it made sense. Okay, well, there's only a few possible choices for the energy. So, what, when was it? What year? Okay, so Planck then, at this point, spends the rest of his time trying to derive this constant and figure out where this constant was. So he throws his effort into that category. Meanwhile, it turns out that we now know that that's not possible, that this is a universal constant, just like capital G is a universal gravitational constant, or E uh, being the charge of the electron. These are universal constants. So he ran around trying to prove this, or uh, make this into something else, um, and was unsuccessful, never even did it. Planck gets the Nobel Prize in 1918, yay. Um, and this is where my little beef with it is. He didn't even believe the own, his own thing that he came up with. He didn't even necessarily think it was right. He also did absolutely nothing with it once he came up with it. He tossed this out there and everyone else jumped on the bandwagon and then proved the rest of quantum theory and he just said, I still think it might be wrong, I'm gonna sit here and try to prove this constant to be something else. Which isn't wrong, I'm not saying that, you know, that doesn't happen. I would love to win the Nobel Prize, that'd be great. But he gets a constant, he gets a Nobel Prize, everyone knows his name, nobody else knows a lot of other people's names, and he didn't even believe the whole thing he came up with. What? Why here? Yeah, nobody knows my name, man. Why not? Well, there is an astronaut named Jerry Ross. Yeah. Jerry L. Ross, even. It's Jerry yeah, Lynn yeah. Ross. And so if I do any searches of anything that I work with with NASA or any of my rockets or anything, of course, Jerry Lynn Ross comes up because I think he actually he has the record for the most uh, launches into space or the most times in space. Something like that. He's got a, a substantial record, even though I had never heard of the guy until I started you know, searching for me and found nothing about him. <laughs> what are the odds that you guys have the same middle name? How annoying is that? Yeah, you can search it for yourself on Google. You've never Googled yourself? No. Well, no. You've seriously never Googled yourself? No, I'm not ashamed to say that I've Googled myself. I've Googled myself a lot. You're just ashamed you're funny. No, I do that all the time. When you get to grad school and you start publishing papers and whatnot, you'll find that you Google yourself all the time because you want to know what sort of things are drawing attention to yourself. I'm Googling Good or bad. What? Good or bad. <laughs> Good or bad, yeah. Yeah, I'm surprised. Did so you, so you ever find yourself? Right. So what? Did you ever find yourself? Yeah, but I'm on like page three. The easiest way to find me is if you put in Princeton. So if you just type Jerry Ross Princeton, then I come up all over the place. But if you just do Jerry Ross or you do Jerry L. Ross, you're not going to find me until like page three. I don't search past page one. Do you need a trinkina? Oh, you need a trinkina, Sarah? Oh wait, there was two. Okay, photoelectric effect. Wait, that was impressive. <laughs> it down and it's gone. It's like sugar is fat. Okay. All right, photoelectric effect. This is another thing. So now, the year. The year is 1880. Then. Heinrich Hertz. Now, who's heard of Heinrich Hertz? I've heard of Hertz. Yes, car rental. Not the same, unfortunately. It's not the same. Have you really? No. I, was, I feel like it's from Griffin's Hills or Pekin. Yeah, okay, so you did see it in Pekin. This guy did cool stuff. You guys don't know his name, but you have heard of Plunk, I'm sure. Of course, it's Plunk. Or Hertz. It's on there, but basically. Well, you gotta find a constant. I mean, that's the trick to life. You know, find a constant and then you win. So, so when you're the one in here who has an FPK? What? 
don't know. Like one of us no, three. Brad and Drew have it. And she's the one who actually finished it. Oh, you dropped out too? Oh, yeah. Uh, I didn't know that. He lost something up with the week. How far did you? I got like six and a half weeks or something. Oh, you got a ways in there, though. So you have to take it again? Or are you not doing sports money? Yeah. Okay. Heinrich Hertz. What did he do? Well, he showed an interesting phenomenon. Um, he showed that if you take a light source and bounce it off a metal surface, all of a sudden you kick off electrons. This is kind of neat. And you're like, well, why do I care about that? Well, because it, what are you doing, sir? Yeah, put your phone away. Put it too. Yeah, that's fine. Put your phone away, please. You can Google me later. All right. Light. Produces electrons. Light produces electrons. Cool stuff. It was never known before. So if you can bounce light off of metal, and you can actually hook up a circuit where you're shining a light on a metal surface, kicking off these electrons and having it actually pass through and then turn on a light bulb elsewhere. So just light impacting a surface. Fascinating stuff. Now. Oh yeah, so we gotta talk about a couple things. Now, what he was working on was for different metal surfaces and different light sources, how much energy actually took to knock an electron off. So there was an understanding kind of at the atomic level that electrons existed and that you could that they required a certain amount of energy because they were tied to the atomic structure. So I mean, just like anything else, if I wanted to go up there and rip Jared's hat off, it's gonna take a certain amount of energy for me to do that. Depending on how angry he gets, it might take more energy. Okay, so this energy is, how, what was this energy called? Anybody know? Amount of energy required to remove an electron from a solid? Uh, is it a heat transfer? Hmm. It's a something function. There you go, say it. Not wave function. Oh, okay. No, uh, it does start with W, that's why I thought you had it. Um, wave function? Work function. Yeah. Oh, well, about the gas that. Are you? Let just a guess, but not work function. Work function is the amount of, and it's usually denoted as phi. Now, in my field, I work with something known as ionization potential. I've probably talked to you guys about this before. This is not in your book, it's not. Um, work function phi or ionization potential. What the heck is ionization potential? So yeah, is it like the same like? With the periodic table, with the trends, like the ionization energy requirement? Yeah, so the thing you see in the periodic table is talking about the ionization potential or possibly the work function. It depends on your periodic table, but you can see either one of those on there. Ionization potential in, so let's say I'm talking about, I'm firing a thruster on xenon, and I say the ionization potential of xenon is 12.1, 12.3, pick it 12.3, it's been a while. Um, electron volts. That means that for every atom that I want to ionize, that I want to turn into an ion, I have to add 12.3 electron volts of energy just to get rid of the stupid electron in the first place. So that sounds an awful lot like the work function. Turns out they are the same thing, or at least they're describing the same thing. A work function is specifically for solids. The amount of energy that it takes to rip an electron off of a solid. Over here, the ionization potential is for gases and sometimes also refers to for all fluids, for liquids. But primarily this is used for solids and gases. We honestly don't try to rip electrons off water, or at least I'm not familiar with the fields that do do that. They need microphones. A small type. Interesting. Now in case you wanted to video record the whole course, maybe so you can also hear the students talking. Probably if you can hear anybody in the audience. Anyway, all right. So these basically are the same thing. So I was actually doing some research today because I wanted to know what the difference between these two is. Turns out they're the same thing. Same thing, except for it does matter. It takes sometimes more energy. Uh, the work function can be higher than the ionization. Why? Because when you're in this lattice structure, when your solids, everything's tied together, it's more difficult to rip an electron off because you also have the bonding strength between the atoms. Okay, in a solid, electrons are shared between everything. So it can be more difficult. But the principles behind it are the same. All right, so we're going to talk about work functions because we're going to be talking about solids. Okay. Now, some things that you should expect to find. Um, okay. First, if this is true, that light can knock off electrons. 
the first thing that we would expect, um, if you can find, if you find a light metal combo that works. So this is kind of soft. If you find a light metal combo works, that means you found something that the surface I can hit with light, I do get the electrons off. What sort of things do we expect to find? All right, a couple simple experiments we can do. First, turning off the quantity. Increase quantity. Should equal more electrons. In other words, if we increase the amount of quantity of the photons that we're firing at this, then we should increase the number of electrons that fire off. That's kind of what we expected. Next. Changes in wavelength should at best be linearly affected. In other words, a 500 nanometer light, which is what color is that? You perked right up at that. Green. Green. Really? Yeah. Cool. Green. So 500 is green, then if you go up to 600, which is orange, you should still get, you know, it, somehow it's literally dependent on the wavelength, then if you get 50% here, then you should have 20% there on the amount of electrons. Um, a little bit we're going to show that that isn't the case. Next, okay, if you reduce the intensity, reduce intensity of light, okay, now not the amount of light, but instead you can send a wavelength, so I can send a 500 nanometer wavelength like this, okay, that determines the wavelength. This has a certain amount of amplitude, the intensity of light is certain, or I can also send a 500 nanometer wavelength like this. This is the same wavelength, it's just not going to be as intense, it's not going to be as bright. Now keep in mind that it's different than the amount of photons you can send. You can send very, very intense photons, or you can send a lot of them. Okay, so you can hype up each individual photon, or you can send a bunch of low intensity photons. How does that work? How does a photon not just a photon? Well, because it has a, it, as a wave function, we're assuming that wave functions, back to wave theory, has a certain amplitude associated with it. The amplitude gives it more energy. The wavelength determines its color. Is that because it's move, it has to move faster? Or it's yeah, because it's got to go up faster. and down, up and down. And this gets back to the idea that the tighter wavelengths will go like yeah. this. Okay. So the frequency also would increase that. All right, so those are our two choices. So if we reduce the intensity, reduction in kinetic energy. What do I mean by that? The idea is that if you shoot this a photon in and an electron comes off, the electron is going to come off with a certain amount of kinetic energy. It came off, it has energy, it goes someplace. The idea was assumed that, well, the photon came in with enough energy to knock off the wavelength here and also on top of that add some kinetic energy into the electron. So whatever energy that was left over from the photon coming in should have all gone into kinetic energy. All right, so the idea being is they've said if they reduce the intensity, if you reduce the magnitude of the light, you should reduce the amount of kinetic energy that you see in the, the electron. It shouldn't come off as much. And let's see. Um, increasing the amplitude should increase, so that's the other way to go about it. Um, and let, next, time lag. All right, time lag was an interesting idea. The whole point was they assumed that light was a wavelength. If you assume light is a wavelength, then what's going to happen is, so say you've got your wavelength of light coming in, and here's your structure, your atomic structure, and you've got your bonds going like this. They looked at, as the wavelength is going to come in, it's going to start to charge this. And it's going to start to oscillate back and forth until it speeds it up, and then all of a sudden knocks the electron off. So as the wavelength is hitting something, it's basically charging it up. It's giving it energy. And then when enough energy happens, bam, the electron comes off. That was the theory. Turns out that's not what happened. Okay. All right. Turns out none of these things happened at all. So they were testing sodium. Let's talk about that now. Mm -hmm. 
and a sodium source, Na. They're shooting light out. All right, why sodium? What can you tell me about sodium? Chemists. One of the metal charges. Okay. What kind of material is it, though? Sodium, table salt. That's not a metal, is it? Melancholy. Yeah, it is. It is melancholy. And it's known as a soft metal. You know, we think of it as just salt or table salt. But um, if you actually look at it, it's, you know, it's a shiny, if you get chunks of it, it is a shiny metal-like sub substance. Okay, so, we're soft. so they were shooting sodium with a 500 nanometer wavelength light. Now, the problem is, what they were doing is they turned up the intensity, expecting more electrons to come off. No. Then they increased the amplitude of light. They expected the kinetic energy of the electrons to change. No. They also expected a time delay from the amount of time that they shot that the electron came off. No. If they shot the smallest packet of waves that they could at it, instantly electrons. There was no heat of time. There was no time lag at all. You turned off the light, and it instantly stopped as well. There was none of this heating up or anything of that. It wasn't working. Now, the most bizarre part about this was what they were finding is that if we look at this as a function of wavelength and energy, Okay, in other words, photons that came off, we would see something like this. That yes, at 500, we have some sort of peak at 500, maybe, and we got to 600, boom, it turned off. Literally, if you could dial your wavelength, so you're slightly changing it from green, yellow, orange, boom, and it turned itself off. Now, so if you used a very low intensity, a very dull green light to shine on the metal, you get some electrons off. If you had tenfold that intensity, you had this gigantic orange cone of light that you shine on sodium, nothing. Not a single electron would come off. This was a huge problem, and this was the thing that he was demonstrating. Somebody explained this. Why on earth is there this cliff in wavelength or frequency that all of a sudden we don't see this effect anymore? Okay, so Einstein answered that question. Quantization of light. The year. 1905, quantization of light. Einstein says, ah, I can solve this. Light is not a wave. Light is a particle, or at least can behave like a particle. It can behave like a particle using Planck's constant. And say that the energy of a photon is equal to h times the frequency. Very, very simple. Now, he's using this new fancy uh, constant that was just discovered five years ago that Planck is still not really believing it. All right, so his argument was you have one photon, and he's the one who kind of came up with that term, comes in, ejects one electron, and then goes poof, and disappears. So here's a change of ideas. So we've got Maxwell's equations that are saying that electromagnetic theory is going all around. All of his equations are sound, and all of a sudden Einstein says, nope, light are now tiny little objects known as photons that are given energy like this. So what's actually going on is an electron comes in, hits, and since it's an object, it's a single object, it can't hit more than one device. It can only hit, you guys can help? Well, I just wondered if you guys are confused about something. No. 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 Okay. I'm listening. Um, so as the photon comes in, it can only hit one object. It's one electron. When it hits the electron, that electron, that one electron is ejected and then goes poof. This turns out that it explained everything. It explained why the electrons are immediately ejected. Because if that one photon had enough energy, then off comes the electron. If it didn't, then what's going to happen is that energy is going to instantly be absorbed by the lattice structure. So in other words, um, think of it like a, I don't know how you want to describe this, like a mattress. 
if you could somehow hit a mattress coil really hard with a rock, what would end up happening is that boom, you would launch the, the coil out of the mattress. I guess. So the idea being is if you don't hit it hard enough, what's going to end up happening is that the whole bed instantly absorbs that energy. So there's no building it up. You just have to hit it hard enough that you bounce it off in the first place. Sure. I'm trying to think of another way to do that. You can think of it as like punching a table that has a quarter on it. If you hit it soft enough, the quarter comes up and it gives the energy back to the table instantly. If you smack it hard enough, the quarter's going to go flying off the table. There we go. I like that one a little bit better. Okay. What do you say? Do you want to try it? Uh, oh, sure, feel free to. Hey, we are allowed for I want to do a demonstration. Wait, what? You have a cooler enough energy to bounce the off. No, the idea being is if I leave a coin here and I bounce it lightly, then it's going to bounce up and back down and it's going to dissipate its energy into the table. If I hit it hard enough, it's going to fly off the table. But the point being is if, if I hit the coin and I'm not hitting it hard enough, it's going to come up and hit the table. I could do that all day long. Keep adding energy and it just keeps going up, 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 and it never bounces off the table. And so the idea being is that even though I've used a lot more energy over time, the quarter is still going to fall off. You have to use just enough energy the first time for it to fly off the table. So this is what was going on. When you hit the 600 nanometer wavelength, it was not hitting the surface hard enough to knock off any individual electrons. So instead what was going on was you were just heating up your surface. Okay, so anyways, Einstein gets the Nobel Prize in 19... Which, if you remember, we were talking about general relativity before. Do you guys remember when they finally proved this? And how? How did they say that we proved this? They involved the sun. Oh, the solar uh, lunar eclipse. Solar eclipse. Yeah. Yeah, it was when we had the solar eclipse, and that was in 1919. So up to that point, they actually, all of a sudden, the, the moon went in front of the sun, and they looked at the stars as the sun went there, and it looked like they all, all of a sudden just started just sucking towards the sun. And that, that's how it we proved general relativity. In fact, I just got, um, I was just talking to um, Hamilton. I'm trying to develop a lab section for this course. And I asked, is there a way to do general relativity? And there is, because there are large mass of uh, solar systems out there that are large enough to have enough mass that you can see this. So you can watch for that solar system to pass in front of other stars. You can watch all the stars suck in towards it from our point. Would that of always be able to happen every semester? Say it. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. That's like an occasional. Yeah, I don't know how often we would necessarily be able to do that. We could be able to do that every semester or whatever situation. But it would be neat if we could come up with Imagine the planetarium that could like capture it on video somehow. And so we could at least watch it. Yeah. yeah. All right, so Einstein wins the Nobel Prize in 1921 for this. Now keep in mind, he's also the guy that did the special relativity. He's the guy that did the general relativity. He did everything that we've been talking about up till now. Now it was when GR was finally proved um, in 1919 that everyone kind of got on board with everything this guy said, because he did this in 1905, has been right. And they give him the Nobel Prize for this, but honestly, they could give him the Nobel Prize for just about anything at this point. We only got one for everything they did. Um, I think so. Yeah, I think he only did get the one. Do you know that? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm asking. I, um, I don't have knowledge of getting a second one. Let's Google it. Yeah, we can. We'll look it up. But I also think the Nobel Prize are kind of specific about that. I don't think they like giving out multiple prizes to multiple people or you could be doing awesome things. You got your Nobel, be happy, go away. <laughs> okay, so, and he also showed Does something else. Does anybody more than one for your Not that I know of. That's why I said that. I'm not sure that that's a policy, but not that I know of. All right, and he said that Ke max, the maximum amount of energy that can possibly get knocked off in the electron, is going to be equal to the amount of energy that the photon had minus the work function to take it off in the first place. So here's your next equation. Ke max equals hf minus uh, the work function. So, all right, let's solve the problem now. Uh, it's going to be like a problem from the first. Assignment like number one. <laughs> well, it'll be your for multiple hours. No. Why? Just wondering. I don't want to do that anymore. No, 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 no more derivations, please. I hate we're showing things. Yeah. Alright, no, this is just your first example in 3.1, but it's a pretty decent one. Um, here, in fact, I'll read it to you from the book because anyway, this one was broke me. So. What, this recent one? It hurt. Yeah. Just the two problems? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's like, like problems. Problems. Yeah. Oh. 
Cool. You, I'm both page. just kind of like multiple attempts on other pages. Really? Yeah, I've got I didn't hear from any of you guys, so I thought it was easy. Well, it's because I started last night. So yeah, know. and I kind of lost the, I kind of lost the page. Yeah. I, I, I like going back to your lecture before and said, oh, this is easy. I'll take you two lines. And yeah. I'm just thinking, yeah. what the cool. hell? Why am I not getting this? All right. I didn't think it was that bad. Wait. Uh, yeah, all right. I will grade it, and I will give you guys a solution for that tomorrow. Is there a chance I might have actually not have complicated it and got lucky? Oh, Possibly. I, I would complicate the hell out of that. Yeah, well, you guys are telling me now. I wish you guys would have mentioned something earlier. Like you've had that for a week and a half. Yeah, we also learned about it on Tuesday. That is not true. We learned about all the concepts. <laughs> we just went through the one example. You went for all that we should start until you went until we had class on it. That's what you gave yeah. the impression of. What they said. What you oh, said. so sorry. <laughs> and I had to work Tuesday night, so I didn't. You couldn't start the last night. Me not agree with us. Okay. okay. All right, he's on board. Lovely. Too bad. Crazy the home. I will grade it. I will give you guys a. Uh, we need bonus money. Yeah, I completely agree. Well, I'm pretty sure he served the curve. Oh, apparently. Why? Wow. Yeah, I actually think I got the right. Good. I, I All right. You think? I'm worried. So I'm gonna get through this example one before it's done. We can talk about that between afterwards. All right. Example three point one. Light of three hundred nanometer wavelength. Okay. So wavelength three hundred and nan three hundred and eighty. Nanometers, 300 nano. 300 nano, yeah. It's directed at a metal electrode. To determine the electron, determine the energy of the electrons injected, an opposing electrostatic potential difference is established between another electrode. Okay, what do they mean by this? Um, the diagram in there is a little weird. I'll show you how this actually goes down. So, you've got two plates right here, and you've got a laser light that shines through it like this and hits another plate right here. What page is this on? Um, Do we talk about this? In... Uh, I think it's about patterns. Never mind. Not sure. We might have talked about photoelectric. I, I wouldn't be surprised. That sounds familiar. Okay, so the idea here <clears throat> light is going to bounce off and it's going to hit an electron off this negative electrode. Now, where does an electron want to be? On which side of this thing? Oh, what? The electron wants to be on top. Wait, yeah, because uh -huh. Yay. Okay, electron wants to be on the positive end, so it doesn't want to go anywhere. Electron wants to go off and goes, bam, you knocked me off, yay, I'm going to go back home. So, <clears throat> the point being is, if you happen to knock the electron off, that again, it's just like hitting the quarter, the idea being is if it springs off, it's going to spring pretty much directly perpendicular to the surface to go the other direction. We need something like this in Physics too, right? Yes, we do. Yeah. We talked about that. I think that is right. You're right. We had an example of the photoelectric effect without really talking about any of the details of what was going on. It was just an electron was so far away from a positive charge. Right. Part. So then the idea being is if an electron comes off, we want to know what's and if it's actually going to be collected here. So we've got an ammeter over here, which that won't actually work for an ammeter, but that's okay. It's not exactly a complete circle. But we're measuring, through magic, the amount of current that goes to that other plate. We need to know if something's actually going to get here. Okay. <clears throat> now, they're saying that they've set up a potential difference here. So the, the voltmeter is set up as 1.10 1 volts. Question becomes, A, what is the work function of the metal? That's the first part. Work function. All right, so if we solve this, one of the things that we need to point out, though, is we're going to be getting a certain amount of electrons here. Now, what they're telling us is when they tune this to the 1.10 volts, that's the very first time they see any current at all. So the idea is to make this work is you have to have a picoamp meter connected to this thing. So, I mean, you're looking for individual electrons. Keep doing this, keep doing this, adjust it, adjust it, adjust it, make the field weaker, weaker, weaker until you get your first electron. Now, when that's happened, you realize that it's going all the way up this curve and come back down. Now, when it gets here, it has basically zero energy. It's lost all of its kinetic energy. So the problem is, to backwards figure out how much kinetic energy you can get to here, we have to do an energy balance equation. Kinetic initial plus electric energy uh, initial, and we've got kinetic final plus the, the potential, electric potential energy final. I can't talk about that. Mm -hmm. You don't like these? These are fun. You like these? Only if a lot of them cancel out. 
Now, there's a bunch of different ways. Now, we can treat this like a parallel plate capacitor. Okay, that's one of the ways we come up with the electric potential. But there's even an easier way that's just based on the charge. Remember when we wrote this out as one half mv squared, and we wrote this as just two things? Oh. Bonus point for anybody who can say who doesn't have the book open. You're lying. Graph only yeah. made bonus points. Come on, I'll tell you how it's a massive graph. <laughs> No, the charge times just both yeah. just two oh, okay. I remember I hated this stuff. Neither of us. So oh, I. <laughs> I just did. Uh, you should have given us more time. Yeah, off the bonus. We're well, just going to keep, <laughs> you're going to go through all 26 squared combinations. And, uh, that's me. All right. Here we go. QV. So we can say that QV uh, E final is going to be KE. So I can say that my kinetic energy is equal to QV. Which that's not the equation, obviously, for kinetic energy, but we're saying that the initial must be equal to the final, so there we go. Stop it. Or I don't care. All right. We've got seven minutes. It'll live. So we go back to that equation that we had a second ago, and we can say that, um, mm -hmm, that we're going to say that the kinetic energy max is going to be equal to HF minus phi. We want to know phi, so let's move this around. So we've got phi is equal to H final minus K max, KE max. All right, phi equals H, which is a place constant, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joules per second. In the next couple weeks, you might want to memorize that thing for the next, like, eight. It's actually 6.626. Okay, mm -hmm. she's already got it memorized. Well done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds times our frequency. How do we come up with our frequency? We only have a wavelength. Something by is it by by C? Or I, know. I bet you units would tell us. Uh, yeah, that's more out. You know that I don't use units. Don't ask me. <laughs> Grr, you will learn to use units. You know, we should have an entire class of units. I got through all of physics. I hate it, all of you. All right. Wavelength. <laughs> Why do you hate me? I didn't need her. I didn't do anything. Exactly. You don't use units. I said the time for my own units. I need frequency. Okay. And Nina correctly used units, but also suggested that we use the speed of light. It's a photon. So it's one over second. If it's light. What? Frequency is one over second. Right. So what am I going to do? How do I get wavelength, which is in meters? Um, how do I get frequency out of this? Do a barrel roll. If I do C up here, meters per second, and divide by frequency, which is 1 over a second, that gives me back my meters. Any which way you want to memorize this is fine. So now we can say that frequency is going to be C over the wavelength. So I can do 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, <clears throat> divided by 380 times 10 to the negative 9 meters. Yes, and whenever you're dealing with nanometers, when you're dealing with wavelength, don't bother to try and put it in like 3.8 times 10 to the minus 7. That's just weird. Always leave it as times 10 to the minus 9. Okay, that's just an easier way to look at it. We know that's nanometers. That's 380 times 10 to the minus Yeah, that's what that's supposed to say. Oh, that's, yeah, okay. All right, that's just my HF. Now I have to subtract 
my kinetic energy max. So this is going to be what? What do I put in here for Q? Uh, yeah, is it 1.6? Yeah, there you go, 1.6. 1.6 is fine. Times 10 for what? 27? No! That's the mass of a proton. Minus 19 joules. Okay, times our voltage, which is 1.10 volts. So, we shove all of this junk into our calculator. And we get an answer of 5 equals 3.47 times 10 to minus 19 joules. Now, a lot of times we want to speak in terms of electron volts because it's easier. So what is, in terms of electron volts, the energy difference between the two electrodes to begin with? Just looking at that over there. The energy difference, the potential energy across that in electron volts is what? So if I ask you just, what is this in EV? We don't have to pick up a calculator, I promise. Say so yes and start. Say and then one times. I like that. 1.1 electron volts. The whole idea of an electron volt is it's one volt traveled for an electron. That's the amount of energy. So 1.1 volts is 1.1 electron volts. <coughs> so what does that tell us? If this is the actual energy, Q times V, this is the 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. So in order to convert from joules to electron volts, you have to divide by 1.1, or 1.6 times 10 to the minus 17. If you do that, over here, you're going to get an answer of 2.17 electron volts. Yay, electron volts. So that's the same as the bulk there. Different, though, because one is a term of potential, the other one's a term of energy. So it's the amount of energy, and specifically an electron or a proton, would get by going across that. So, well, so that's why it's a little confusing. They are different. One is energy, one is potential. What well, did you divide the joules by? I divided this by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 17. Which is the charge. The, the amount of, which is the charge. That gets us to the electron volts. Electron volts. That's the conversion between the two. So something you're always going to want to know. It's an easy way to go back and forth because we get nice numbers to work with. 2.17. That's a lot better. There's no max points there. All right, now part B asks us. Ma the maximum wavelength light that can eject electrons from this metal. Okay, so we got this. The maximum electron or the maximum wavelength of light. Let me erase all this so that we don't have to move that around. So this has nothing to do with the space or anything like that. That's simply saying wavelength max is what? Well, what is going on and what are you doing, Brad? You know damn well I'm <laughs> sorry. A water bottle. <laughs> Where is this? I say you water bottle? You did. You did not. Guys, come on, we have like two minutes in class. I know. <laughs> I'm listening. Sorry. Take, take I, I have no idea what your water bottle is. David did something with it. They Just sit you. down for a minute. Oh, you guys, come on. All right, so the wavelength max. The maximum wavelength that we can eject from this is going to be the one where the electron just barely comes off. Okay, if the electron barely comes off, that means it doesn't have any kinetic energy. Okay, so it's going to be hard to record, but that's what we know. In other words, any other wavelength of light, we knock this off, it's going to have some kinetic energy left over, and it's going to come flying out. Let me prove this to you. Ke max equals n. HF minus the work function. Now, if the work function is 2.17 electron volts, okay, this has to be, the energy has to be greater than 2.17 electron volts for us to have any energy at all, any kinetic energy in the electron. If it's less than that, then the electron doesn't come off in the first place. So basically, we can only take energies that are greater than 2.17 electron volts in the first place, so we end up with some Ke max. This is just a function of the frequency, period. Or, seeing as how we can get the wavelength out of that, or the wavelength. So I can rewrite this equation to say that zero, the absolute minimum, is going to be equal to h, and the frequency we showed over there is equal to c over our wavelength minus five. Jared, are you on board now? Do you understand what I mean? Well, I just don't understand that. It has zero kinetic energy that comes off the ball. Oh, it's the very 
So we're talking about the lift. So the okay. idea is if you get 0 .0001 off this, it yeah. has enough kinetic energy to leave. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? So the wavelength that we get, if you shot that wavelength, we would get nothing. Right, you would knock yeah. electrons off and yeah. then they would get sucked right back in. So if they would you would just, measure nothing? Right. You would measure nothing. Okay. So you'd have to add, you'd have to go one, one millionth of a yeah. nanometer lower. Right. Okay, so now we just got to solve this. So if we move phi over there, we take phi is equal to hc over lambda, and we want lambda, so lambda equals hc over phi. And now we can put this into our calculator. So we've got 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules per second, multiplied by 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. All divided by what we had before, which I think was 3.47. 3.47 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. And we're going to get a wavelength. And the wavelength we get is 573 nanometers. Now, the other way to do this is you can solve this right off the bat and solve it for frequency, and that's what the book does. You can solve it for frequency and then convert it to the wavelength later on in the event, either way, frequency or wavelength. Now, I'm making the assumption that this equation now is something that you have in the back of your head, and you can easily go back and forth between frequency and wavelength for light, because it's always going to be moving at that speed. It should be doing something. All right, no homework for tonight, because you're missing your test coming up. Anytime after 4 tomorrow, you can stop by and grab your this homework assignment and your other homework assignments. I think I have one more. And by 5, I should have um, a proof of how to do that problem. Yeah. Oh, Everything's really well. Okay. Yeah, let's see what else does. Come on, Dave. Have I moved from the show? Okay, you just tell him what's wrong with that. Yo, everybody's back. Have you seen me move? You lost shit? your old water bottle? My water bottle was sitting right here when I got it. Okay, he found it right over here. Have you seen me move out of the chair the entire time? No. All right. So. Okay, good point. I can blame Brad. You lost your own water bottle and water bottle in the room. I you lost your own water bottle. I'm not intelligent. I lost the intelligence. I lost the intelligence. I didn't gain any from it. Okay. I'm not the only one. Yeah. Yeah. I just came in here today with a sense of defeat. Yep. That was here till after midnight last night. Welcome, Bucky. Okay. Okay. Right. Well, I tried to come back here before class, but you, but you never hear on Wednesdays. Not normally. I am. Yeah, we got other things. Easy these days. No, we need to, we need to start trying to catch you if we actually hear it out. No, that works. At night is the best time to get after my class is done. I do all my work then. Before class is not prepared. Yeah, yeah. rules? I will say we'll do this together. Okay. Well, we'll just you David, can you So Monday night. Oh, yeah, no, he'll be in the office at 8.30. After, after or up to? After you turn? Yeah. Okay. Actually, because I, know, I think I know where it's at. It's about four hours from here, sitting in the house, sitting, I'm missing a good book. I'll bring off another one and stay with you. Okay, so it's the kind of idea that I was like, I said, was it to basically take this two equation, just gamma equals blank, and then turn it to the and it's all over there? Yeah, I don't even remember the problem with the sentence. E squared equals. I remember when I looked at it and wrote it out, and I did use two, two more two yeah, steps. Yeah. Like, I think I made two simple examples. Did. Brad, did you get a copy? Not yet. I only made it like four steps. Oh, that's for sure. But, uh, yeah, that, that took a long while. Okay. Was it helpful or did it just feel like busy work? It, uh, like busy it just work. felt like busy work for algebra. Man, I'm sorry about all the derivations. Yeah, I have the equation I need right there. I just use that. Like uh, the yeah, second exactly. one, I don't like if I made that too hard or not. I don't like giving you guys busy work. That wasn't my goal. Yeah, the second one I didn't. I don't know, I don't know if my calculator just couldn't calculate that low a number or what. Um, also, we weren't given the radius that it was orbiting around, so we had to calculate our, ourselves. Correct? All right. Next. Well, I, I thought the radius cancels. 
if I remember correctly. I don't remember the problems. Oh, you see, what I do is, I just think they had in the book that, that I just assumed the juice were when they was kind of set the one the book used. Tell me what the problem was. Do you guys remember what the wording of it? What was the best? Uh, Satellite, geosynchronous orbit, time difference. Yeah. Oh yeah, it wasn't too, it wasn't supposed to be too dissimilar to the example in the book. Yeah, like I just no. I mean I pretty much I made that a lot more difficult than it should have been. I mean, I like those was I don't know. This what do you mean? But it was in geosynchronous, right? Yeah. So you could have just pulled the radius for geosynchronous orbit straight out of the problem. Yeah, so I mean I found its own orbit. Oh, okay. I found its speed. Wait, so do we have to use the T lower equals T higher? Yeah, like time difference, yeah. I mean I did that and I guess that you could calculate it. I, I had everything incorrectly, it's just my calculator plugged into it. I got like 46 and a half microseconds, I think that's what it was. I was 48 and 48. Well, see, there you go. Yeah, I got just, I mean, I, mean, I figured these, these, I'm just going to work this Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah. 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 It doesn't change. I mean, it's just... I hate to say it, of course, but for the first half of the problem, I pretty much just copied down from the book. Okay. Because, just like, this looks right.